Well, that was interesting, kind of caught me by surprise today. I guess when you have a live stream scheduled using whatever the default settings are on this thing, it just turns on and starts showing your image while you're uh, uploading. So anyways, whatever. Um, so what are we doing this week? We have a few interesting things to talk about. Probably at the top of the list is going to be the iPhone 7 no service repair. And uh, beyond that, something really cool that came in, and actually I got a sent link, sent a link by someone else who uh, we had probably talked about this several times on previous live streams, and that is smart glasses and how they are taking one step closer to becoming a real thing that people will embrace instead of freaking out about seeing and, and try to rip off your head like they did with the Google Glass. And I thought it would be interesting to take a look at at least one of the iPhone clones that are out there and it's funny because down there in the title it says iPhone 7 it's supposed to be iPhone 10 anyways uh, be that as it may let's get this thing started so I thought it might be a better idea because you know I'm kind of trying to decide between whether to start this thing 15 minutes early so everyone gets a uh, notification that the stream is starting or just start it right on the dot when it's supposed to and I think today I'll probably I might even go back and edit this thing because of the way that uh, we kind of had a false start here like I said I'm still learning how to use this stuff uh, not to mention the fact that all my keywords for this video can somehow picked up by default the ones from last week anyhow uh, interesting stuff coming up I'm gonna hold off from, for just a few minutes and make sure everyone gets on here first meanwhile say hello Beha what's going on uh, hello to everyone. How was your weekend? Did you have a great time? Did you watch the Super Bowl? And what else is happening? I can tell you in my part of the world right now, we have just apparently entered into the unofficial start of allergy season, which sucks. So that means that every time I do anything, including this, I'm going to be somewhat medicated and trying to counteract that with caffeine. So I don't know, you know, between uh, Zyrtec and caffeine together, you just kind of feel a little... Uh, cloudy but awake at the same time if that makes any sense anyways we'll make it through one way or another you know Beha you had sent me a link about what was it I was just looking at it. oh the uh, iPhone 7 home button and I will try to remember to go over that also but that was one of the things that we had talked about a few streams back where that U10 IC I believe it is which they're calling the turtle IC because it's going to be different from one phone to another that is something that can be replaced because it's one of the few things within the home button security system, if you want to call it that, which is interchangeable from one to another, or it can be repaired, I guess. You can basically reball it because they end up getting the solder points underneath it disconnected and cracked. And it's very interesting that that tool that they sell for it actually uses one of those old, one of the more old school types of soldering irons where you just have that white filament on the inside and you put that inside of a little chamber that heats it up. So that's kind of cool. Um, hey, Harvey, how's it going? Tech for your needs. What's happening? Uh, great stream last Thursday. Great selection of entertaining guests. Thank you so much. I was hoping that you guys would enjoy that as much as I did. I had, I have so much fun when I have people on. So that's something I want to do more regularly. The guys that I contacted were super cool, you know, from the get go. They were very cooperative and just excited to come on and we had a great time together and I think it went pretty smoothly. You know, there wasn't too much of one person talking over another. And the inter interesting thing is that when you reach out to people to invite them onto a live stream or interview of any sort, there's a lot of skepticism, you know, even among YouTube creators, people that stand there and look at the camera and make videos all day long. When you say, hey, why don't we go on live and do an interview? I think there's a bit of... Uh, kind of an apprehensiveness to, oh, I have to just, you know, speak on the fly and, you know, what kind of questions are we going to, are you going to answer, are you going to ask me and what kind of topics are we going to cover? And I try to assure them, you know, it's very casual. We just sit back and talk about things that we know and we enjoy. So for anybody, if you haven't checked that out, I'd encourage you to. It's from uh, last Thursday's live stream. I'm not sure what the lineup is going to be this week, so I will put that information up here as soon as it becomes available and let you guys know. Pa Patriot Tech Gaming, what's going on? Um, let's see, you might get more views if you let the mucus flow while streaming. <laughs> Man, I don't know, I'll tell you, uh, right now it's pretty mild, but I guess the pollen count has just jumped up, like within, uh, yesterday, it just for some reason took off, so I've noticed it, I've been sneezing all over the place, so that's the kind of thing, that's the thing I'm gonna try to spare you guys from, so you won't have to watch that, I'll hit the, my little, uh, absent button there and mute the microphone if I remember to, 
And one of the things about my allergies is for some reason I sneeze about seven to ten times instead of once like a normal person. So I hate to make you guys suffer through that. Anyways, uh, we got some people in the chat. It's time to get this thing rolling. So let's see, about four minutes. So I think next time what I'll do is I'll just give like a five-minute warning. I just hate to put nothing on the screen in the meantime. So I have some ideas as to how we can cover that. So one of the things I thought was very interesting, and it was funny because uh, throughout the last two months or so I've been talking about this you know before CES and everything and that is the smart wearable glasses that I think I think are going to be a big thing you know that to me to me that makes sense what is the next step some sort of you know beyond planting um, electronics into somebody's brain you know which apparently they're looking at that also but I think a more practical thing is how do we have a heads-up display right in front of us that allows us to interface with some of the information that we would like to be able to access and that's exactly what this is these are really interesting actually let me bring this down so i can see and uh, let's get the chat opened up here so your comments will show so these uh it, this is intel that's working on this They're, it's called vault and it's pretty cool they have a video i will put that link down in the description along with the sources to all of the information in this live stream and of course some timestamps, so if you want to jump to a particular section, you can do that. While I'm at it, let me remind you the routine. If you would, please like and um, subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate that. It helps me out tremendously, as does posting a lot of videos, apparently. So this seems to be what YouTube wants, and I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I wanted to let all of my regular subscribers know that I'm going to be kind of experimenting with a few different things over the next 30 days or so, because... Uh, while I want to make sure that you enjoy the, the content that's on this channel, I also have to try to be friendly with YouTube search engine. So I'm trying a few different tweaks here and there. So you might see some things up here and then they might not be there the next week. And the reason for that is I have to make sure that this is favorable to the YouTube algorithm. Otherwise, it doesn't really help my channel. So I, I want to make sure that anyone who's interested in this information can find it easily. And that's the whole point behind what I'm doing here. So... The smart wearables, let me uh, let me make this a little bigger because actually let me pop out my chat because I can't even read what you guys are typing. Yes, I need glasses. Let's see. Let's get this thing up here. There we go. Uh, what program are you using to live stream? Lots of people using OBS. Yeah, I am um, tech. I'm actually using OBS right now and I like it. It certainly has its challenges, but it's difficult to complain because it's free for the most part. So I'm using OBS right now. I'm looking at a couple others. There's like really only one other alternative. And right now the name escapes me, but um, there's some things I'd like to be able to do. And I'm convinced that my computer can handle it and my internet connection can handle it. But for some reason it doesn't work through Google Hangouts. And I would like to be able to use Google Hangouts, but you just don't get any, you know, very little functionality on there and lots of problems if you try to stream video, like it just doesn't run smoothly. So um, yeah, OBS for the moment. Uh, Ziad. Ziad, hi, thanks for the info. Yeah, no problem. I hope that you found something uh, helpful on the channel if that's what you're referring to. Uh, so anyways, back to these glasses. These are cool. I'll put the, the links down at the bottom. There's a video. It's like a good five or ten minutes long, I want to say, and they show exactly how these things are designed, what they're meant to do. Uh, let me pull up some of the highlights. This is what I thought was interesting. Number one, this is one of the reasons that I think this will be adopted uh, and much more accepted than the pr prior you know prototypes that we've seen and that is there is no camera on these glasses so you're not walking around taking pictures or video of people without their knowledge and that i think is going to be a big plus because obviously if someone points a camera at you even if you're in public and you know technically there's not a lot you can do about it a lot of people take offense to that and that's understandable you know to think that you're getting pictures taken of you or you know your spouse or your kids or anything like that it's kind of creepy so you know it's like what are you doing with the camera right these glasses no camera. So obviously there will be some limitations on the information that you'll be able to access from what's around you. You know, it's not going to be based on an image, but they do have some other sensors built in and they have quite a bit of functionality as far as connecting to your smartphone. They do have Bluetooth built in. So obviously there will be a way to interface with these through your phone. They are going to be under 50 grams. So they're not going to be super heavy, you know, so that you feel this thing that you're wearing around on your face all day long. They use a level one, let's see, a uh, low level class one laser so these things actually project an image onto your retina from the glasses but we've been assured by intel anyways that it's a very low level completely safe 
and you will be able to have just a very small image down at the bottom of your screen that will give you information based on your inputs or your questions or whatever else you're doing because they're um, it says it doesn't have a microphone yet, but I think they're considering this as something that they'll add into the hardware so that you can be, you know, one of the things that they were talking about is this might be using Alexa eventually, which means that you'd have some sort of connection between you and your voice assistant where you say something. And the example they gave was you're in the kitchen and you say, hey, what are the ingredients for this? And it gives you a heads up display right inside of your glasses that shows you what the you know whatever information it is that you need to access and you don't have to move your head and look down at your phone or pick up a tablet or anything like that so functionality wise it looks like this is really going to be uh, much more friendly in that respect much more convenient and make a lot more sense now the interesting thing is that they also stated that if you get incoming text messages if you're getting gps directions anything like that all that stuff's going to show up you know right down here along the bottom of that screen so all you do is kind of just glance down and you're going to be able to see this information coming in and then you can still look ahead of you and they have some very subtle um, head signals that you use because there is a compass and an accelerometer built into these glasses so if you wanted to open up a message, you would just make a slight motion to one direction and that would open the message on your display. And when you wanted to swipe it away, you'd make another slight motion with your head to the opposite direction and that would move that text message or you know whatever that alert is on your screen out of the way so that you can get back to what you're doing. So uh, very interesting. They're saying that even at this point in time, they can go up to 18 hours on a single charge. So I remember one of the big concerns about smart glasses would be how are you going to get a battery inside these things to make it you know practical so that it makes it through an entire day it sounds like with the current specs they figured out a way to make that happen so uh, i'm really convinced this is going to be the next big thing i could be completely wrong but this is my sort of um idea of the future when it comes to smart technology oh where'd my chat go uh, smart glasses are terrible devices it'll create a group of cross-eyed individuals that is entirely possible and you know something else Harvey it's going you know during there's about four or five different articles that I researched here and one of the things was it's also going to make it even easier for people to be distracted and pay attention to something else while you think that they're talking to you so they're look you know you think they're looking ahead having a conversation with you and meanwhile they could have some text scrolling across the bottom of the screen they could be playing a game with someone else they could be reading text messages you know who knows what maybe they will um, maybe they will actually end up having some sort of problem for you know this is always a risk right this could have some negative health effects for people wearing them I agree completely and then it'll end up like that scene in the jerk where every everyone gets a class action settlement for uh, one dollar and nine cents or something like that ironically guys you're gonna laugh okay you remember the big scandal speaking of Wells Fargo uh, I think it was about a year ago or so where they just paid out on a class action settlement and my girlfriend just received her compensation from Wells Fargo in the amount of exactly one dollar. Like that's what that's what the settlement was when you try, you know you divide it up amongst all these different people who are part of this uh, class action suit, and she ended up getting a dollar out of it, which is funny because they actually printed and sent her a check for one dollar. So, um, you know, obviously the reason, I guess, the motivation behind class action is to kind of make those companies pay a price and and feel a pain and not want to do it again but as far as the recipients of that award go if you've got a lot of people involved i'd say don't look you know don't look ahead or don't look forward to a huge amount of money smart glasses are dangerous while driving that would be another good argument tech i can imagine you know if we think that people are distracted right now with their phones you know with text messaging if you're wearing these things non-stop and you're driving yeah, that could be bad for a lot of people. And, you know, the thing is always this. I always felt like, and, and I don't do this and I don't endorse it, but, you know, 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, I could text and drive at the same time. And that's when we didn't even have screens. So you could, you know, without looking at your phone, just using the T9 where you had like nine, 10 digits that you were punching on to spell out a word. I was like, I could do that without looking at my phone. And again, before they passed any laws against it, yes, occasionally I would lift up my sm my phone and read my text message while I was driving. And you know, as soon as you know, as soon as we came to the realization that that's not safe for everyone, obviously I put the phone away, stopped texting and driving. But now what you know people are doing is they're holding their phones down below the dashboard and looking down at it to read the text message instead of holding it up front. You know, what's the worst? The the worst of those two evils, I don't know. But the bottom line I think is that distracted driving is 
not equal across the board. There are certainly some people who are much more prone to become distracted and to continue to engage in that activity that's dangerous. And there are other people who are probably skillful and practiced enough in order to do both at once, but you can't have a law that only pertains to one group of people. So it has to be everyone, right? And I would agree that, that uh, the distraction factor on smart glasses, that would be a big problem. Uh, let me move back here so to make sure I don't miss anything. Wirecast is the other program. I think there's another one, Tech. There's, there's something else and... Uh, it's actually one that you have to pay for, and I'm going blank on it. I can Google it in a second if you want me to look it up. But if you look up live streaming and gaming or something like that, there are really two main choices. And I, I don't think it's Wirecast. I could be wrong. I think there's one other one that's pretty popular. And it doesn't get used as much because it's it's a pay-to-use pay to app, and it also isn't as good, in most people's opinion, as OBS is. I guess it has some features that they like, but not everything. Um, let's see. Use that $1 to buy a lottery ticket. Yeah, exactly. Wouldn't that be great? Hit the like button. Nine guys watching. Awesome. Hey, we got nine guys. Let's see. Oh, it could be some girls too. You never know. Uh, hey, Nate, what's going on? Thanks for the email. It's so funny that Nate had sent me the email link to the, I think it was the Verge article about these smart glasses. And like I said, I got this this morning, probably about the same time that you did, because I have all these alerts that hit me when something breaks. And as soon as I saw this, I got excited because I, I really think that this is going to be going to be a big deal. It's interesting that it's Intel that is behind this current design, because, you know, I was thinking that maybe some smaller company would come in and pioneer this technology and probably become acquired by someone else. But if Intel's involved in it, then they're, they're obviously going to, um, you know, have this thing, I think, from beginning to, to the point that it gets to market. The good old days, T9 was great. I am telling you right now, one of the things about giving up a keyboard is that I was so, I was, I felt so accomplished to be driving in my car and I could literally text T9 all day long and I never even had to look and see if I was punching in the right thing. My eyes were on the road the whole time and I knew where the buttons were and how many times to count for each digit. But man, imagine the amount of time that we spent trying to spell out one word on that stuff. I mean, you get, you get faster at it after a while. Patriot, oh, it was easier to go. Yeah, wasn't it though? And there was a, lo a little level of satisfaction with the click of the keys. Yeah, that, 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 what do you call that? Uh, the feedback that you get, the tactile feedback, I guess, by clicking the button. Tech couple, what's going on? Hey, have not seen you for a while. Who am I talking to? Is it both of the tech couple or just one? I hope you're doing well as all, everyone. The tech couple is a party. It is a couple, obviously. A couple people that I did a live stream. Uh, one of my first live stream uh, group things on Google, Google Hangouts with on Easy Computer Solutions channel. By all means, check out their, their channel. It is growing rapidly. They do tech reviews on not just phone stuff. Corey, I actually really enjoyed that smart lock thing that you did on how to get into your door and how to install it and set it up and all that stuff. And very comprehensive reviews behind the pros and cons of the accessories or devices that they're looking at. So by all means, check them out, people. And Corey, you guys, let me know when you are available. I've got a spot for you just about any Thursday night you want to come on. Uh, if we have to, we'll do something another night of the week. But I'm really looking forward to have you guys come on here. And Eric as well. I haven't heard back from him. I sent the invite out, out to him. Uh, open door whenever you guys are ready to come on. Just let me know. I would love to have you. All right. So as far as these glasses go... I doubt that you're going to be able to get rich by buying into Intel at this point because they're already uh, pretty much up there. I was like I said, I was really hoping that there would be some third party that developed this. They do an IPO and we could all get rich, but I don't think that's going to be the case if it's if it's Intel. But I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong. Now the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and uh, let's see, I'm about to just take off the horse and record. Other thing that I wanted to bring up right up front, and that is this topic that I went over briefly yesterday and I'm kind of experimenting again by doing like a little preview Sunday so hopefully we can generate some interest and get you know get tons of people in here uh, Apple has acknowledged and this is the interesting thing because I think at this point you know after the battery scandal if you want to call it that I am of the opinion that Apple is going to be very careful about protecting their reputation you know at one point we kind of got the feeling that Apple was, you know, take it or leave it. If you don't like our products, you don't have to buy them. They are what they are. They cost what they cost. 
you know, too bad. But uh, for any company, when they reach a certain point of market saturation, you have to acquire new customers or you have to get your existing customers to buy more of your products. And I think that from what we're seeing in Apple sales and Apple stock prices, a lot of people who like Apple have bought their iPhone and their tablet and their computer. And there are a certain percentage of those people who are waiting for the next big thing to come out. But there are a lot of people who might kind of feel like, yeah, you know, I've got an iPhone 7, 7 Plus. I, I don't necessarily need the 8. I don't need the 10. So how else do we sell? How do we get more people into that marketplace? And one of the ways that you do that is you make sure that your reputation remains untarnished. So this is my kind of my feelings as to why Apple is stepping up very early, you know, before they before it becomes a big deal and they're acknowledging this problem with what I imagine has got to be the baseband CPU or the baseband uh, PMIC, which is causing problems for the iPhone 7 to lose signal. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Jessa Jones kind of came up with this, to the best of my knowledge, came up with this theory that everything that's adjacent to the SIM card tray is kind of the weak point or the fault line for the iPhone so that when they bend, because remember, we've got those, those logic boards are screwed down from top to bottom. And that's one of the things about Apple's designs that might actually end up being a detriment long-term to just about any phone that they make. And that is when you bend the outside of the housing, you're also flexing the logic board on the inside. And as we know, those connections are just super, super tiny. So you put any stress on any of those any of those integrated circuits and you get a crack in the solder, you get a cold solder, you know, something chips off there and then you don't get a good connection anymore. Kind of like we had with the touch disease for the iPhone 6. So on the iPhone 7, it appears to be affecting the baseband CPU, I assume. And of course the, you know, the tricky thing about that is the location of these components now, it's, it's very risky to go in there and start repairing this stuff. And while Apple announced that they were going to repair them in store, I do not believe that that is the case. I'm convinced that you bring your phone in, you say, I have this no service problem, and then they replace your phone with a refurbished unit because obviously, you know, we've had this conversation many times. It would not make sense for a company to give you a brand new anything, you know, if we're talking about a, a five, six, seven hundred dollar item, they're going to give you one that's already been repaired and replace it for you because they can't just, you know, spend five, seven hundred dollars every time someone has a problem with the device. So, uh, unfortunately, a lot of customers get that impression when they when they do a warranty exchange or they think that they're getting a brand new anything, and typically you're not. So, we don't really know what the history of that device is, but we know that they typically come with a limited warranty. And in many cases, that warranty has now been reduced from what you had on your original phone. So that's kind of the downside to this. Now, uh, the other downside is, is I don't know of a lot of a lot of technicians or a lot of companies who would want to take on reattaching that baseband CPU or the baseband PMIC because there's so much risk involved. You know, those are one of those things where we really get to the point where we have no other options. There's no other way to, to make the phone work. And without it, you don't have a phone. And we go, okay, well, let's give it a shot, right? Well, in this case, if you have the option of going back to Apple and swapping it out for a phone that does work and has some sort of warranty on it, you know, I, I, all things being equal, I want to be, I, I want to give people the best option that they have. And I think at this point in time, from what we know about it, the best option is probably to take your phone back to Apple and get it replaced if you have one of the affected devices. Now, what's gonna happen long-term, uh, unfortunately, is that they're probably going to experience the same the same problem over time because most of these fixes just involve, if anything, throwing a bunch of underfill on top of the chip, which still doesn't really fix the problem that they have. And that's the stress that's being placed on the integrate, integrated circuits when the phone's being flexed. So um, for whatever reasons though, like I said, I think that Apple's very concerned about their reputation at this point and making their stockholders happy and making sure the public perceives them as a trustworthy company, which is something that Apple has really you know, been known for in the past. When you buy an Apple product, you think that, hey, I got the best thing. It just works, you know, it works consistently. Uh, Apple's gonna protect me as a consumer. They're gonna give me good stuff and not garbage. And for that reason, I think it makes sense for Apple to step up, you know, almost preemptively and say, yeah, we know there's a problem, we're gonna fix it. Now, how long are they gonna do that for and what's gonna happen when the warranty expires? I don't know, but right now, they're going all the way back to the beginning of when this device was manufactured. So they're not saying, oh, if you bought it within the last year, you know, we'll take care of it. They're saying if you bought one that was manufactured since September of 2016, that they will replace, uh, they say repair, but I'm pretty sure they mean replace by that. Uh, let's see, let me go back here real quick. Okay, email me, Corey, let me know what's up, man. I'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, is this another version of AntennaGate? 
I don't think it's Intenigate, Harvey, and the respect that this is an actual problem. If you remember with the Intenigate, they kind of had, you know, they said that the phone would show no signal or no service or low service, even though it was still getting a good signal and it was just a miscommunication between the antenna system and the, or uh, the part that reads the signal and the antenna system itself. And so, you know, you were still getting a signal, but it just didn't look like it. That was my understanding. Uh, in this case, you're actually gonna have a problem where, again, to my understanding, you're not gonna be getting service, but you know what? That doesn't make sense because one of the articles where I read actually did say that it's going to say there's no, sig you know, I gotta tell you, it's a little confusing and, and anyone who wants to check these out, let me know what you make of it. The impression that I got, wasn't really conclusive because it says that the phone thinks that there's no signal when there is actually one available. So does that mean it's not connecting? Because if it's not connecting to a signal that's there, then that means there's a hardware problem that needs to be repaired in order to make a phone call. But if it says that there's no signal because the phone can't see that there's a signal at all, like it's not communicating that signal through the baseband chip, then there's a more serious problem. So I, I'm not completely clear on which one that is. Um, you know, if, if you picked up your phone and it said no signal and you could still make a call, we've actually seen that before. So that'd be a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I would like to talk to someone firsthand who's experienced this problem. I've got an iPhone 7 so far, it's, it's worked pretty well, you know, but if it starts to develop this issue, uh, I'm glad you asked that, Harvey. I'm gonna dig a little deeper into that and figure out exactly what's going on with those phones. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we're caught up there, I think. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm really not sure. That's a good question. And I've read through all these articles, so they really didn't indicate that it was, uh, you know, affecting people to the extent that they could not make a phone call. It was saying that there was no, there was a no service signal and that there was actually still a signal available. It didn't say that the phone was getting a signal and it could make a call. So it was a little, I'm a little unclear on, uh, on exactly what that is. I wish I could answer that for you, um, but you know, obviously, if it's not making a call, then there's there's something. I, I'm very suspicious that this is in fact more serious than Antenagate, because all the conversations about these articles that I've read seem to point to the baseband, uh, the baseband um, CPU as being the problem. But I, I don't know that for a fact, and this came out yesterday, so I, I will follow up on that and let you know for sure what's going on with it. In the meantime, I do wanna get your opinion, everyone, on these iPhone clones, especially those of you who are working in phone repair because uh, this is one of our favorite things. And if you guys will, let me see if I can find my little deal here. If you guys will excuse me for just a moment, I wanna grab something, so I'll be right back. All right, I thought I had some post-it notes around here just because it might be interesting. Let's see if I can do this without uh, giving everything away here. So here it is, everyone. This is a check. I don't know if you can actually see that. It's probably too far away. One dollar, one dollar exactly from Wells Fargo. I'm not sure where I'm gonna ins where I'm gonna spend this or where we're going to invest it, you know? Try not to spend it all in one place, obviously. But that's the reward that you get from class action lawsuits. All right, so um, here's the thing. I saw this, and I don't even know if I'm gonna pronounce this correctly. There's a company called Okitel, I think. It's O-U-K-I-T-E-L, it's a Chinese company. And they apparently, there it is, Okitel, Alcatel. I, I'm really not sure how it's pronounced. I've never seen one of these here in the US, but a lot of the companies that solicit us for accessories and uh, you know all sorts of stuff like that. They're always pushing this brand and they make very inexpensive phones. You'll see this Ocatel U18 21 to nine screen. It looks like an iPhone 10. It's actually a little taller than the iPhone 10 and it has a slightly thicker bezel at the bottom. It does have face recognition. It also has a touch ID system built into it and 
It's not $1,000, it's $159. Of course, it does not run iOS, and that is the big catch. You know, every time we see iPhone clones, they have always got an Android operating system, and you think that that would be a clue for people who take a look at them and think that they're buying an iPhone, and yet every once in a while we'll have someone come into the store who's having trouble with their iPhone, and then when we look at the charging port, we immediately know, you know, if you couldn't tell by looking at the phone, you look at the charge port, and if it has a USB-C, or previously a micro USB, you obviously don't have an iPhone. I'm sorry you spent so much money for it. And they usually spend like a few hundred bucks thinking they're getting a deal and they end up with something like this. So, uh, you know, the biggest downside to these are that they're typically not something that is practical to repair. You know, if you have a $159 phone and you break the screen, the first question is how do we source those parts? Because most of our distributors don't make parts available for phones that are worth, you know, less than a, a few hundred bucks most of the time. And even if they do, one of the big problems with these is that the construction on the inside makes it very difficult to repair them. So I had mentioned this in some of the phones that we now see as being pretty decent quality fit into this category of phones that in historically we would never service. And I brought these up last week too. You know, if you look at something like Huawei or ZTE, Back in, you know, just a few years ago, I'd say about five, six years ago, those phones were not repairable. If they broke, you just buy another phone. But since then, those two companies have come quite a, way, quite a ways. Obviously, if you, if you have an iPhone, or if you have an iPhone, if you have an Android phone that looks like an iPhone 10, has facial recognition built into it, touch ID, and cost $159 to buy retail, then obviously, you know, the, the cost of making that phone has to be pretty low. So most of the time what would happen is you would take these phones apart and you would fix one problem and as soon as you put them back together, there's another problem and another problem or if you can get the thing working in the first place. And I had this experience with quite a few of the, they call them goo phones, so they're like an iPhone but they're not really iPhones. And we also had one that came in that was supposed to be a Galaxy S4, I think it was, and it is just manufactured so inexpensively that you can tell when you open it up, this thing is not gonna go back together right. And this is one that I wanna say that blue kind of fits into this category also. I've had people bring in the blue phones and it's, again, very difficult to source the parts and even if you get the parts, you take these things apart, put them back together. How much do you charge a customer when you're repairing a $100 phone if you had to replace something that cost 50 bucks, you know, you, you quickly approach the value of the phone itself. So for all practical purposes, I want to say in, at least in the U S right now, if you look at something that's under the $200 price point, in most cases, you're going to be looking at a disposable phone. And there are some exceptions to that, but it's very difficult to be able to offer a customer something that they perceive as, as a decent, you know, a reasonable price on something that has such a low cost to start with in relation to the replacement parts and the labor that you put into them. I am, however, at the same time intrigued by these devices. So I think that I might try to get a side by side on something like this U18. There are a bunch of them out there. There's about three or four different companies now that are making pretty much iPhone 10s that aren't actually iPhone 10s that are running on Androids. And I'm very interested to see performance wise, interface, how well they did. And some of these clones are pretty, pretty decent. You know, you put them side by side and it's very difficult to tell them apart. So it's not really a big surprise that people end up basically getting scammed. You know, they see something on Craigslist or even on eBay or something at this point and they buy it and it ends up not being what they thought it was because someone has imported this. In fact, there was a story very recently about a guy who had imported, let me see if I can find the article here real quick. There is a man, oh, I think it's in my other email, give me one second here. There was a Chinese guy I wanna say, according to the article, where'd it go? Well, now I can't find it. I'll have to go back into my email. Anyways, there was a guy who was arrested for uh, importing a bunch of counterfeit phones. And it's kind of funny, you know, because obviously, I guess because you can pass them off in the process of a sale. You know, you could tell somebody that you have something that isn't what it really is. And even though those of us who are phone fanatics or phone technicians or phone reviewers, it's easy enough for us to look at it and say, hey, this is not the real deal. But if you look at someone who's not really into smartphones, maybe they're buying it as a gift for someone. It's, it's, there's a good possibility that they might get scammed 
with something like this saying, oh, you know, my relative, my niece, my nephew, whatever, wants an iPhone 10 for Christmas. I found one for $400 and got a great deal. And then it ends up not being what it is. So I, I can see why they're they're going after people who are importing this stuff. But I, I want to buy one for my own use. To, like I said, just to put them side by side, and, you know, kind of kind of see the differences. The, the obvious one, of course, being the operating system. Harvey, Viva Las Vegas, indeed. These clones are terrible. They overheat very quickly and are unstable. I, I want to see that for myself. I, I'll take your word for it. They're probably, you know, worse than I can imagine, but I really want to see exactly what the downside is and what makes it obvious. What's going on, playlist? Good to see you. You should make sure that check isn't fraudulent. You know, Beha, I, I definitely, I should go to Wells Fargo to cash the check and make sure that by doing so, have you ever seen those checks where you and they say that you're, they're giving you money to start a business or whatever, but by endorsing the back of the check, you're actually agreeing to some loan terms or something like that? Well, this one doesn't have anything funny on the back. It's just the regular endorsement section, but yeah. Uh, and also cash promptly, void and subject to redistribution if not cash within 90 days. So if I don't cash this check, with, if she doesn't cash this check within 90 days, she doesn't get that dollar. I imagine that means that it goes to someone else because you would think that if there's a class action and some of the people who are entitled to part of that settlement don't get their money, the rest of that money should be distributed, right? Amongst the other people that did. I don't know if that's how it works or if Wells Fargo gets to keep their money or what, but that is a company that I... Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about because I just I just remembered why we don't talk about brand names on here. In regard to baseband issues, I've only done one baseband CPU reball on an iPhone 6. Definitely a challenging repair. Not that not one that I would make a habit of. Hey, playlist, I want to ask you. Two and a half hours of my life gone. Yeah, that was the thing for me. I had to reball that thing about three or four times because I couldn't get everything nice and even. And I even tried using solder balls, which I've kind of moved away from. I found that the pace works a lot better, but man, I had the hardest time. You know, I go through, get the whole thing perfect, and then there'd be like one little ball missing. And then when you lift it up and you set it down, you know how that that uh, solder paste likes to get underneath there, and then you end up with little extra pieces and stuff. So I agree, that thing took me quite a bit of time. And man, talk about nerve wracking, you know, getting that thing aligned. Although I found a little trick, and actually I'll upload some pictures as soon as I get a chance. There are two areas. Uh, if you if you had the board with the SIM card on, if you had the board horizontal, and the SIM card tray was on this side, uh, this is going to be backwards if I try to explain it. But there are two chips that you probably found that are very easy to align the edges. So I really couldn't trust that I was getting that thing centered just by eyeballing it. And instead, I aligned it vertically and horizontally in two different positions, and feel very lucky. There could have very well been some luck involved with that, but I got the thing on and I did have a problem with it after I put it back in the phone. So what I ended up doing, and I'm I'm curious as to what your method was, and I talked to Nate and he said he, or Nate, you said that you ran the jumper directly out to the VIA right next to the chip. And my concern with doing that was that with over time, there's not a lot of room for that wire to flex. So if it breaks off again, you know, that be, might be a problem. So I wanted to go around the board kind of like Jessa did in her video. And for some reason I ended up having problems with that. It would go back to losing service. And eventually what I did is I cut the wire short and I actually ran through a hole in the center of the board. If you look at it, you've probably noticed there's a very small kind of oval shaped hole right next to the chip. And I ran through that to the test point on the other side. And that thing's been good for about a week now. So that was my method of getting it done and also, at, at, at that point, where we were able to put all the screws back in and it still held signal. So I don't know if that's the way to go or if there's any reason not to. Uh, the downside, of course, is you kind of have to carve out the shielding so that they're not putting pressure on the wire. But I mean, that just takes a couple snips with, the, with a uh, pair of uh, wire cutters. I placed the chip about two or three times before it actually worked. Wow, really? Okay, so I'm guessing you got very lucky that nothing bridged in that process because that was my big concern. I did when I placed it, I placed it once. And like I said, I will, I don't have any trouble admitting that there was probably a huge degree of luck involved, involved, but it was my first time doing it. I set it once and it worked and I never pulled the chip up again. And I was always very concerned, you know, after watching the cautions that those, those contacts are so close together that man, if you bridge something that's hot next to something that's ground, you're putting a ton of current through that little chip that's not made to handle very much. So um, that's awesome to know that you ha you did it a few times and it still ended up working. That was my big concern. All right, so where are my notes? Here they are. 
So I think that was a lot of the stuff that I wanted to cover today. Let's see, let's pull up my browser here. I swear there was something in my email that I wanted to share with you guys. Let me see if I can pull, let me see if I can find it real quick. People have told me that it's much more forgiving to do a live stream because people know you're live, right? Oh, that's not the right browser. But there was one more story that I just saw kind of last minute here. Here we go. That yeah, is on my screen. And can we share the screen? I don't know if we can. Here's what it says. Ch uh, this is on Engadget. Chinese man pleads guilty to selling counterfeit Apple gear in US. He received 1.1 million as part of a plan involving US residents. I'm not gonna read the entire article, of course, here, but it says that he trafficked more than 40,000 counterfeit electronic devices from China between 2009 and 2014. So there's a long period of time, including iPads and iPhones. All told, he received a whopping 1.1 million in payments. Now, I don't know all the details. I have to go through and read the article, but I assume that he was probably selling these to resellers on some level because how, oh, I don't know, he could have been selling them through his own store or something. Piano with Sam, what's going on? Uh, he, let's see what else we can go over. He is facing sentencing on May 30th. These sorts of operations are common worldwide, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so it doesn't give a whole lot of details here. He was actually living in the US on a student visa, ended up making $1.1 million selling counterfeit Apple devices, and they've been making their way through the years. Yeah, so nothing new. I mean, we, we've seen counterfeits, but it seems to me like with Apple, it's pretty easy to tell, you know, as in contrast with Android devices, those Android devices that are actually running an Android operating system, and they're designed to look just like an Android device. I'm telling you on that Galaxy S4, when we saw that one, we I seriously took the back panel off and as I was taking the screws out, I kind of did a double take and thought it looked a little funny, but until I got the back panel off of the phone, you know, without going into the settings because the screen was smashed, so we had to replace the screen. So you couldn't really see the display. From the outside, as far as the design went, that thing was, it looked exactly like a Galaxy S4. As soon as you pop the back housing off, you see that the display cables are in a different configuration. So uh, that was a big waste of time. But um, with iPhones, you think that most people are going to be able to tell the difference. I don't know. But I am, I, I'm really thinking about getting one of these counterfeit iPhone things just to check them out. All right, did I miss any questions? Because if I did, we'll go back. And otherwise, I think it is time just about. I know this is kind of a short one today. I've got a bunch of stuff on my table. I've got to get done. And I do appreciate y'all showing up. If you've got any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. Within the next couple minutes, we'll be logging out here pretty soon. And we'll leave it open to discussion for the moment. Oh, I guess if I scroll down, I could get more of this. Wow, sorry guys. I am way behind on the comments because uh, I have a second screen open and I didn't scroll, so perfect. Where are we? Or at least I thought I did. Uh, there used to be a lot of vendors in downtown LA selling knockoffs. Yeah, I think if you go to the flea market, you can still find that kind of stuff, right? They still exist, but the have less, uh, they still exist, but the have, they have, they have less electronic devices. Is the only way to tell a part a fake from a legit attic um, Apple products are by way of iTunes? No, Johnny, what's going on? If you turn on an iPhone, you should easily be able to recognize when it's running Android. You know, my, my test just by looking at it is if you take a look at an iPhone and you suspect that it might not be real, look at the charge port first off because if you've got a USB-C or a micro USB, Obviously, that is not going to be an iPhone. That should be your first clue. You know, really, that should be conclusive evidence because the only iPhones you're going to see are the old style, what are they, 21 pin connectors and the lightning port as of this point in time. Eventually, hopefully, Apple will get into USB C. But for right now, if you have USB C or a micro USB on a phone, it is not an Apple device beyond that. If you, if you turn the device on, you should be able to tell pretty easily when, whether you're running. Uh, iOS or uh, some version of Android. If you go into the settings, you can confirm that. And what we've noticed most of the time is that even on the really good clones, while they look like an iPhone from the outside, the operating system tends to be pretty laggy. And I don't know why. I guess it's because they figure they're going to make a cheap knockoff. They're going to make everything cheap. I at least if they put a decent processor in there, you know what? You might get by a few people and as they're scrolling the pages, it looks like it's very responsive. But in my experience, they haven't been. 
I think that another thing would be that if you're looking at a more modern iPhone clone, when it comes to the 3D touch, I'm not aware that any of those exist. And I could be wrong on this, but I think if you saw something from iPhone 6S and forward, and it didn't have that 3D touch built into it, then that should be a pretty good indication that you're not dealing with an iPhone, you know, in addition to the last couple of things that I mentioned. So it, it should be pretty obvious. You may get flagged by the post office if you buy fake phones. Oh man, I got a story for you on that one. <laughs> I went to the post office to ship something a couple days ago and the person behind the counter was misinformed. So obviously I'm not going to name any names or locations, but I got to tell you, I left the post office not being very happy because for one thing, they tried to tell me that USPS does not ship anything with the lithium ion battery. And I said, yes, you do. You can ship them by ground. Well, first there was confusion as to batteries in general, because I said, yes, I'm, you know, I want to make sure this ships ground because you can't ship lithium ion batteries by plane. That is a federal regulation. You have to let USPS know. I'm not saying that there aren't people doing it, but you're not supposed to do it. And I'm definitely not going to get caught shipping something I'm not supposed to. So, you know, by all means, I make sure if it's supposed to ship ground, I ship it ground if it's got a battery in it. And that typically includes any kind of phone or tablet, right? So I said, look, I need this package to go ground because it has a battery. And... She, what did she say? She said something along the lines of, you can't ship all, you know, certain batteries can't be shipped. And I said, well, you know, this battery can't be shipped by air because it's a battery inside of a phone. And my understanding is that batteries can't be shipped by air. And she said, oh, no, you can ship batteries. You just can't ship lithium batteries. And I was like, well, that's pretty much every battery that anyone's likely to use, right? And she was very adamant that no, plenty of people use batteries that aren't lithium batteries. I'm going, okay, fine. Yes, you can ship your Ever-Ready batteries. But I think in many cases, people are nowadays, you know, uh, step into the 90s, we're usually dealing with some sort of rechargeable battery if you have a handheld device or a tablet. And she, like I said, she was very adamant that no, lots of lots of phones use AAA batteries. So I, I just let that one go. Okay, I said, that's fine. But look, here's the deal. I need to ship this phone by ground. And she said, there's no way that you're allowed to ship a cell phone if it has a lithium battery inside of it. And I was taken aback to say the least, not to mention the fact that during my explanation to her that I've been doing this for quite some time, she literally put her hand in my face and said, stop, 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 stop right there. And I was I, like, I was shocked. You know, I'm like, what, why are you, why are you reacting this way? Why are you being rude to me? All I'm saying is that I've been sending these batteries for quite some time. No, nope, stop, 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 stop talking. And obviously when you're dealing with a federal employee, you have to choose your words carefully. So I did not react, although I was very tempted to. And I said, okay, fine. Look, here's the deal. I've been shipping phones. I just want to ship this phone. And she said, you can't, it has a lithium battery. So I said, okay, uh, I believe that you are mistaken about that. So of course she calls over someone who knows what they're doing who says, oh yeah, you can ship batteries by ground all the time. You just can't ship them by air, which is what I knew to be the case. But to have someone behind the counter who is supposed to be qualified to understand how shipping processes work, be completely misinformed as to what you're allowed to ship was a bit concerning to me. So, you know, I just took my package and I left. I said, I'll figure this out later. Uh, where were we? There's a reason I got off on that tangent uh, and it had to do with the batteries. Uh, sorry about that, guys. I lost my way here. I lost my place. Uh, you get flagged by the post office. Yeah, so I'm not, go you know, I don't want to uh, engage in any activity that obviously has legal ramifications that are negative. So if we can't ship at USPS, I don't want to be flagged. I don't want to ship anything that we're not supposed to. So maybe that's not a great idea. Uh, and they typically come through China Post. So maybe I can't buy a counterfeit phone. I certainly don't want to do that if I'll be breaking any laws. I would assume that if you're buying something for your own use, that they wouldn't really be concerned with the end user so much as the supplier. But if I'm wrong, then obviously I won't be buying any counterfeit phones. Thank you for mentioning that. I will definitely do my research before I take any risks like that. You don't want to mess around with, again, like I said, any federal or you know anything that's regulated by um, the federal government, you don't want to take your chances with. It's better to err on the safe side, right? Managed to get my money back on the activation locked iPhone Piano Sam. 
Seller never responded on PayPal. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, good for you, man. That's good to hear. And that, that's one of the things that when people, and by the way, I, I should mention this up front, but um, what I'm going to do from now on, everyone, is rather than, at least for the time being, rather than asking for donations, because I don't want to do that. I, I want to give you some value for anything that you get here, and I certainly don't want to have any any charges associated with watching a live stream. That's just silly, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, continue to direct people to my tools and supply page. If you'd like to check out GoCellPhoneRepair.com, I have lots of stuff for sale. If you buy something there, I, whether it's from me or through one of my affiliate links on eBay, you will be helping to support my channel. And if you buy something from eBay, and this is what I love about eBay, true, you have to be careful about what you're buying, especially when it comes to replacement parts. But there are ways to determine who you're dealing with and how reputable they are. That's the thing that I love about eBay, number one. Secondly is, as uh, Piano Sam has noticed, that if you have any problems with the purchase that you make on eBay, you have eBay, you have PayPal, and you have your credit card company. So you have three layers of protection to make sure that you as a customer are satisfied and not getting ripped off. And that's why I love eBay. I've dealt with some other, uh, some different online suppliers, uh, you know, big online suppliers that sell all sorts of stuff. And I've had numerous problems and got the feeling that their concern is not as customer orientated as eBay is, which is why that is my preferred uh, vendor when it comes to affiliate sales. So just throwing a little word in there. I'll put a link down in the bottom in the description of this video if I haven't already. If you want to help, uh, help out my channel, just click there and make your next eBay purchase, but make sure you make it within 24 hours. This is the thing that I hate about affiliate sales. You got 24 hours to make the, the sale and then forget it. You don't get anything. So whatever. It is what it is. Um, thanks for the stream, Mike. Uh, YouTube didn't notify me about the stream starting. I don't know what's going on with that, guys. I'm going to figure out a better notification system. You can certainly follow me on Twitter. It's at fix my cell phone. That way, when the streams start, it automatically sends out a tweet. And you'll also see the topics that I'm going to be discussing for the most part because I will typically use Twitter to remind myself of things that I want to talk about when I get on here. So anytime I come across an interesting article, quite often I will tweet that at fix my cell phone so that later on I come back and go, okay, here's what's in my Twitter feed and here's what I want to include, include in the live stream. So that might be a backup plan, you know, because I've noticed the same thing. I have YouTube set to notify me when something's going to happen. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, or maybe sometimes it just slips through because I have a number of notifications coming real fast. I don't know what the, what the problem is, but I certainly... I'm excited to see you all show up here. So I want to make sure that you're getting notified uh, voluntarily, of course, if you want to participate and be here for the live stream. If your middle name was Mohammed like mine, you would be in Guantanamo. Oh, boy. I, Beha, I kind of don't want to touch that. And at the same time, I hear you. I, I understand. There's some weird stuff going on, um, especially when it comes to phone calls and emailing and texting and uh, the type of name that you have and going to airports. I know, man, it, it's crazy. It is a crazy world we live in. And that's all I'm going to say here publicly because YouTube has also gotten a little funny about what you discuss when it comes to politics. So uh, unfortunately, I'll leave that for a conversation that we have between us. That lady clerk was in a training personnel. You have to be patient. Johnny, I wish I could agree with you, but I've seen her there for at least the last two years. So that excuse for her is not going to work. She has been there for quite some time. And I don't know if she was in a bad mood that day, just happened to forget something, what was going on. But she was very unpleasant and quite misinformed about how the post office handles shipping of lithium batteries. So, yeah, I, I wish that was the case. You know, I'm very patient when somebody's on their first day. I understand. But she's been there for at least two years because that's how long I've been here using the post office. She's been there from day one. So, you don't have to have a high school diploma to work in the post office. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would imagine that, that sounds fair enough. Have you seen the TriStars tester? I have, guys, guess what? I have one, speaking of, waiting for me at the post office right now. I bought it, I've got my multimeter ready, ready to go, and I want to start using that thing, figuring it out, and making a tutorial video. That is one of the coolest things ever. You don't have to start taking things apart and guessing and unplugging, so yes, I do playlist. I've got one at the post office right now. I'm going to pick it up seriously as soon as this stream is finished. Uh, I think I mentioned up here in the little scrolling thing at the top, I'm also going to be working on an antenna connector replacement video. I'm going to try doing that, doing it with that new microscope that I have, the Andon Star that I showed you guys a couple weeks ago, which 
I have done a micro USB charging port with it and it worked. I won't say it was the easiest thing in the world, but it can definitely be done. When it comes to smaller components, I would say the jury is still out. I tried that and I fumbled around quite a bit with that one. So for inspection and a few other uses, I think it's a great scope. It's certainly not going to take the place of a stereoscope for most people, but I'm going to see if I can change out an antenna connector with it because I think for a lot of hot air projects, it might be usable. I think when it comes to things like hot tweezers and soldering on the board with a soldering iron, it might be a little more difficult without having that perception of depth. So that will be coming up this week. Uh, where can I get a TriStar tester? Nate, you can get one. Or, um, if playlist didn't already answer you yeah ebay and aliexpress i got mine on ebay uh if you like i'll put a link down to that also and maybe tomorrow i'll make a video on that so you can check it out but yes i'm really excited about that one thanks for bringing that up paypal are also usually into the buyer's favor providing you have a valid point yeah and piano this is the thing i've told people before that i i used to sell on ebay quite a bit and now i am more of an ebay customer and not so much of an eBay seller only because I know that in it, most of the time you're dealing with trustworthy people but occasionally you're not and occasionally people will try to scam you on eBay uh, or anywhere else for that matter and when they do knowing that the, it's almost always going to go into the buyer's favor rather than the seller I prefer to be a buyer and not a seller. I mean, to me, that just makes logical sense. So I don't sell a whole lot of stuff on eBay. I have a few things, but for the most part, you know, the high dollar items, I don't sell on there anymore because, you know, they're, they're, there's just so many factors that go into transporting something that costs several hundred dollars and not knowing the person on the other end. And you know what really killed it for me on eBay for as a seller is that when you go to buy something on eBay, you can look at the feedback of the person that you're buying from and get an indication of whether or not you want to do business with them, right? And from that point, you decide if you're going to buy from that particular person. Let's go ahead and get this Ocatel thing off of the screen. So you can take, you can kind of check and decide, is that going to work? Where are you? Hold on a second, guys. There we go. So if you're buying on eBay, you can look at the feedback of the seller and decide if you want to do business with them. If you're selling on eBay, you are not allowed to take a look at the buyer's feedback and decide if you want to sell something to them. So for the longest time, I thought this was a huge plus. You just, you have feedback, you look at the buyer's feedback, and if they're not well established or they have a lot of complaints, you don't sell to them. Well, you're not allowed to do that. And to me, that was kind of a deal breaker and made me decide that eBay is a much better platform to buy on than to sell on for that reason. I would like uh, a situation where both buyer and seller establish a reputation and both can choose who they want to do business with and not just one sided, you know. So again, as a, as a buyer, it's a great it's a great arrangement to have when you're in the market for just about anything. They're also available through the usual channels. Okay, we got that. Is it called TriStar Tester? I think it is. Um, I can get you the link, actually. I could probably even put the link on the screen here in a second. Let me let me look it up real quick, guys. Because I should be able to screen capture here somehow, maybe. Oh, man, this thing is so... It's so tricky to use this live. All right, let's see. eBay. I believe it is a Tri... Is it a TriStar Tester? And it is a TriStar Tester, Nate. I think that I can do a screen capture here. So let's see. Yeah, just just uh, search on eBay for TriStar Tester. Literally exactly just that. And you should be able to find it. There's a whole bunch of them. Let's see. And usage videos. Usage videos can be found on YouTube. Perhaps Mike will do a video too. Yeah, I'll definitely do a you. Uh, I'll definitely do a video as long as it's not, you know, if there's a bunch of them out there that are really good, I won't usually do it. But... Um, what I try to do is find a video that maybe needs a little more information or uh, more narration. That's the big one for me. You know, if I watch a video and someone's showing me how to do something, but they're not narrating and they're playing like, especially if they're playing like really crappy music, you can mute the music. But I really find that the narration helps me out with understanding. You know, you get the visual and the audio at the same time. So if I don't find any really good narrated videos out there that demonstrate it, then I'll go ahead and make one. I might just make them for the heck of it anyways. I think it's pretty cool. Would you rather buy from eBay or Alibaba? Personally, hey John, didn't even know you're in here. Personally, I would like to buy from eBay 
if it's in the US. Now, if it's something that's coming from China regardless, it really doesn't matter a whole lot in my opinion between eBay and Alibaba. I found that even with Alibaba, you buy stuff for AliExpress and when it gets here, if you have problems, they are again, very concerned about their reputation and taking care of their customers. So I've never had really bad experiences with um, either of those sites, but obviously the advantage to eBay is that a lot of times you'll find someone selling the same item that was in China on Alibaba or AliExpress, but they're selling it from the US on eBay. So for that purpose, I, I would prefer eBay, but you know, if it's coming from China, it, it really doesn't make a huge difference. It's still going to take 20 to, what is it, like 20 to 90 days to come in. So not a huge preference. Uh, I like Alibaba, it's, it's for the most part, I've had good experiences and like I said, they're real, they're very excited about getting our business and they really care about protecting their customers um, or their sellers rep, or their, I'm sorry, protecting their customers. So I haven't had any problems there. And that company has made huge amounts of money in the last few years. So Alibaba is blowing up. Let's see, do transactions through PayPal doesn't get deposited right away into the seller account? Uh, I'm sorry, let me back up here a couple. I see one on eBay for $10. That sounds about right. Let's see, yeah, $9.99. That's probably the one that I bought, I think. I'd have to log in to check to see for sure, but I, uh, Smart Tech Innovators. I think that's exactly the one that I that I bought. As soon as I get mine today, I'll confirm that and put the direct link down there in the bottom and let you know if it works, of course. You will have to have a multimeter though to interpret the data because you gotta have something to connect onto those test points on the outside. Have you repaired an iPhone 8 yet and have they started producing iPhone 10 aftermarket? Uh, personally, John, I haven't done the iPhone 8. I have seen them repaired. It is not a big deal by any means. And I guess I need to repair one so I can make a video and also kind of be able to answer that and say, yes, I have replaced an iPhone 8 screen. I haven't done one yet. I haven't had to. And have they started producing iPhone 10 aftermarket OLED screens? Not to my knowledge. I, I don't think so. I think it might still be a little while before we see that, but hopefully soon. Might be a hard question to answer without pictures, but did a replacement screen on an iPhone 6, and now the button's a bit dodgy, the home button's a bit dodgy. When I push it down, I can move it around with my finger. What? Let me make sure I understand this. Uh, might be a hard question to answer without pictures. Yeah, that's usually the downside, but I did a replacement screen on a 6, and now the home button is a bit dodgy. When I push it down, I can move it around with my finger. Um, Sam, was there supposed to be more of that com? Oh, here we go. Can can tilt it when pushing hard? Did you check the retaining plate behind the button? That's the first thing that was would come to mind. There's always also a possibility that the little button itself that springs back, there's a little dot right in the center, if I remember correctly. I think they still used it on the iPhone 6. I'd have to take a look inside, but there could be something that got mashed or mis misaligned underneath there. Yeah, if you can send me a picture, it'd be a lot easier to tell. I'm not 100%, I may not be answering your question correctly. Different angles when I push hard, any idea? Can tilt it when pushing hard. Yeah, I'd check the, check the retaining plate that goes behind that and the screws that go into it. And then my next guess would be just lift the button out of the glass and take a look at the, the part that actually clicks when you press on it. And that would be my suspicion. It's probably somewhere there. And then once in a while we do get a screen that has the glass cut in properly and it causes the button to jam. So, you know, you could always try another screen or see if the button moves freely within the glass itself because that's another one that I've seen cause a problem like that. I don't understand why people are surprised that eBay will almost always side with the buyer. If they sided mainly with the seller, then buyers would be hesitant to use their marketplace. Okay, hold on, let me make sure I'm reading that one right. I don't understand why people are surprised that eBay will always side with the buyer. If they sided mainly with the sellers, yeah, then of course, yeah, everyone wants to protect the customer. That's totally understandable. Although I've seen a few examples where uh, it probably should have gone in favor, in favor of the buyer. So they tend to give the benefit of the doubt. Sorry, I got that backwards. The decision should have gone to the seller, but they tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the buyer more often. So I, I think they're a little biased there, but yeah, you, you make a good point. People wanna know that they're buying from a safe marketplace and I think eBay knows that. And I suspect that there are a few other companies that either don't or they're so big that they don't care anymore. But <laughs> I've had some interesting experiences with other 
online marketplaces where they're just like, oh, you have a problem? Don't buy here anymore. You know, whoa, hold on a second. I just wanted to settle the matter, not have you uh, just ban me because I said that I don't agree with something that happened online. And I was very surprised that they didn't seem to have a lot of patience for customers that have problems. So it is what it is, I suppose. And if there's no buyers, the platform is doomed. That is, yeah, can't argue with that logic. Um, bend which way? Inwards. Okay, you guys are talking about that button. And give it a go tomorrow. We've got an aftermarket iPhone screens in the UK. Not cheap, though. When you say aftermarket, do you mean refurbished piano? Like it's not uh, an OLED producer third party, right? You're talking about a refurbished screen, I'm guessing. Because that's really, that seems to be where the cost is going in. And I don't know that there's a a third-party manufacturer outside of the companies that are making, producing them for Apple, but I could be wrong. And you know, anything can change from one minute to the next. So um, I'm hoping that that's gonna be the case very soon. That will make our lives much easier. All right, friends, thank you so much for joining me again. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already, please hit the like button and definitely subscribe. And if you follow me on Twitter, I promise you, I don't spam with a bunch of garbage. I only tweet interesting articles about things that are related to phone and tech industry. And then every time one of my live streams starts, you'll get a no notification, but it will be right when right when the video starts. So I'm trying to figure out whether I wanna do like maybe a preview video before I start the stream, just to give everyone a heads up for like 10 or 15 minutes, but I don't wanna scare away anyone who lands on the channel and says, oh, this isn't actually a live stream, which is another gripe of mine. You know, if you explore, there's something called YouTube, or there's actually a channel on YouTube called Live, just L-I-V-E. And if you go on there, you can see what live streams are available at any given time. And the interesting thing is a lot of those live streams are not live. They are just videos that people create, call them live and stream them, but there's no chat and there will typically be a little notice up in the corner that says this stream was recorded previously. So it's live, but not live. And I don't understand how that qualifies. If I watch a live stream, I wanna know that there's someone on the, on the other end that's paying attention to what I'm putting in the chat. So I, to me, that defeats the purpose. I don't know. That's just me. Nope, not refurbished screens as far as I'm aware. Don't know where they're from, but there's a local screen repair offering. There's a local screen repair offering 10 repairs. Well, I mean, we can get iPhone 10 replacement screens, but they are refurbished. So if they're coming up with a third party supplier, I would be very interested to hear about that. And again, I would suspect that they're gonna be on the on the expensive side, at least for the time being. So again, hopefully that changes. Nate, thanks for joining, or thanks for coming on everybody. Uh, we'll see what's gonna go on this Thursday. It's kind of up in the air at the moment. I will definitely be here at 6 p.m., but things change so rapidly in this marketplace that it's difficult to tell what we'll be talking about, who will be here, <laughs> and what will be going on. But it's always a great time. It is the after hours. Hopefully a lot of you are off work by six o'clock on Thursday. That's why I think it's, it's just as fun uh, maybe in a different way as this one is. Don't buy Mobile Defender's Prime Parts battery for iPhone 6S. The first two I had were defective and the third one worked for a month until it expanded and grew double in size. Well, that is good to know. And since it's coming from John Cassidy, who I've seen here many times before, I'm gonna take your word for it. And that's a bummer, Mobile Defender's, okay. Um, good to know. I'm always interested to hear what the consistency on quality is. And one thing about batteries is it is very difficult to find a consistent OEM iPhone battery supplier for a number of reasons. And in fact, there are quite a few ways to take a look at an iPhone battery and tell whether or not it is a legitimate iPhone battery because a lot of them are being packaged as such when they aren't really. So I'll probably do a video on that one eventually. Uh, screen repair 445, yeah, piano. I gotta say that, you know, if that's the case, I don't know why you wouldn't just buy an OEM and that might be what they're, I mean, if they're saying that it's not refurbished, then okay. I'd be really interested to find out where they're getting them from. So if you find that out, let me know and uh, we'll discuss that more. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. I will talk to you Thursday and if not, see you again next Monday. Have an awesome week and see ya.